Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's cyber seminar given by Dave Goodrich. Today he's in Phoenix, Arizona. The title of his talk is Integrated Science and Decision Making, Cutting Edge Science to Address Real World Watershed Issues. My name is John Duncan. I'm the Communications Director here at Kuwazi. If you have any problems today, please feel free to send a chat to the host. If you notice on the right-hand side of your screen, I'm sure that as we're all getting used to this, you're becoming more and more familiar with it, but there is a chat screen there. If you can uh, type in an answer to this question, how many folks are at your institution today? We're still trying to compile some statistics on how many folks are attending these and actually using this uh, seminar series. So as I type that in, folks are starting to respond. And if you have any feedback on this series, uh, please send me an email to commmanager, C-O-M-M-G-R at kowazi.org. And just for your information, this presentation can be downloaded from our website, www.kowazi.org, by navigating to the Cyber Seminar link. So today we're using this operator-assisted service again. If you have questions during the talk, and especially after the talk, please hit star one to speak. This will get you to the operator, and they'll patch you through. If you have any questions, send a chat to the host and presenter so that we can both read it and answer questions that way. And this is we're still in a testing phase with this, so please uh, bear with us. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Robin Hannigan involved with the education outreach component of Kwasi has been organizing these and doing a great job with it. And if you're interested in all, at all in giving one of these cyber seminars, please let either myself or Robin know. We do have two left. Uh, Dave Tux has been rescheduled to March 26th, that's at 3 p.m. And Matt Morris is on April 9th at 3 p.m. So I'm gonna turn this over to Dave and Dave, you should have uh, presenter control right now. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks very much for joining. Um, get started in the talk right now. And I'd like to give you just a little bit of background on the genesis of this talk. Um, and I'll push up the screen here. Uh, again, you can go back to the split screen if you want by pressing the, the button on the bottom left there. Uh, but hopefully you'll get a better view of the slides. And Dave, while you're still on this intro slide, let me introduce you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, David Goodrich has been a, hydro a research hydraulic engineer with USDA Agricultural Research Service in Tucson, Arizona since 1988. And in 1990, he was named an adjunct professor at the University of Arizona in the Department of Hydrology and Water Resources. His current research efforts are directed to scaling issues in rainfall runoff modeling identification of dominant hydrologic processes, incorporation of remotely sensed data into hydrologic models, the functioning of semi-arid riparian systems, and the integration of hydrologic science into watershed management. He co-led the interdisciplinary multi-agency SALSA Semi-Arid Land Surface Atmosphere Research Program. He's a member of the Executive Committee of the University of Arizona NSF-funded SARA STC Science and Technology Center and he's a member of the Upper San Pedro Partnership. He was recently awarded the University of Arizona Achievement Award in 2003. Dave, we're very grateful to have you here with us today, and I'm looking very forward to this presentation. Thank you for all your help getting this set up. Um, in terms of genesis of this talk, uh, this came about uh, initially as from an invitation from the Global Change Subcommittee of the National Academy. And the quandary they posed is that they had spent roughly $2 billion in the 1990s in climate change science and gotten some very good scientific results out of this, but very few of those results were being used in the decision-making context. So they came up with this notion of place-based research as a way to integrate science and decision-making. And you know they were trying to debate, well, what, what's the proper place? Of course, for us in hydrology, the watershed is a logical place. And the, picture you're looking at on the left is the uh, 
San Pedro Riparian Corridor, and adjacent to that, within the San Pedro Basin, is the community of Sierra Vista uh, military installation. Uh, now, first off, I guess I'd like to say I'm really a spokesperson for all of these individuals, and you know, don't view this work as my work at all in any way. This wouldn't have happened without a whole bunch of people and without a whole bunch of different agencies, universities, uh, folks from international institutions as well. So uh, bear that in mind, and I've got to extend my sincere thanks to all of these folks. So I'll start out with the assertion that, you know, of course, good research has been done and can be done in many watersheds, but that successes in joint policy and research are often or often occur due to acute needs, and that's. Partly the recognition of policymakers that sound science is essential, and this is even more so given the complexity of the problems and the decisions that most of, a lot of these folks have to make now. And also the research won't likely address these needs in the near term unless we work uh, with these folks. I like to tell the story of my mentor, uh, Dave Wolheiser, who developed some fundamental kinematic wave theory, and it took really fully 25 years for that research to get fully utilized uh, in the consulting community, and, and my contention is that we have to do better than that. So a theme that I'll, I'll hit on throughout the talk is to get this integration between policy and science is that you have to build trust uh, between the folks, and uh, trust equates to time, uh, and, and it's not a quick process, uh, and we all know how long that can take. So an overview of the presentation, um, I'll try to present an evolution in going from um, you know, sort of basic process science for understanding, uh, then science to address a need or a problem, and this is you know, basically starting to integrate more disciplines. And then finally, on to integrated policy development in science and show some examples of past results and some current research. Uh, after that, I'll try to summarize some lessons learned and, uh, at least in the San Pedro, some successful strategies or models for collaboration. So now, this evolution, again, sort of follows this notion of going from you know, basic process-based science on through a variety of things that integrate more disciplines as well as economists and decision makers. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about each of these, so I won't list them right now. Uh, but anyway, we start with the Walnut Gulch Experimental Watershed. Uh, that's part of the national network of ARS experimental watersheds depicted here. There's 14 of these. Um, they've been running from some 25 to 65 years. We really view these as our same sense that Quasi is looking at the HOs. Um, Walnut Gulch, which is shown here, is a 150 square kilometer watershed. Town of Tombstone is based in the middle of it. All of these dots that you see are either rain gauges or runoff uh, recording instrumentation. There's some 90 rain gauges and uh, about 30 sub-watersheds that are uh, instrumented. And this was developed starting in the 50s to really look at semi-arid process-based understanding uh, of hydrology in this region. But again, given this longevity, um, we look at these, again, as stable, high-quality research platforms. And when they designed the ARS watershed networks, they purposely chose them so that most of them were privately owned and that we need to establish a relationship with the landowners and the land managers. Now, again, this is the same issue that's going to be faced by Quasi uh, in establishing HOs, particularly at a larger scale. And these. Um, because of this infrastructure and the longevity, these have been really a magnet for interdisciplinary uh, experiments and collaboration that we'll talk about. Now, here's the field office in Tombstone. It's not a very exciting picture, but I just wanted to show it because we've got a presence in the community and in the basin. Uh, in other words, we're not outsiders, and this is one aspect of building that level of trust. Now, a little bit about the hydrologic regime uh, of Walnut Gulch. Uh, it's dominated by air mass thunderstorms in the summer that generate virtually all of the runoff. Uh, they're limited spatial extent, high intensity. We also, that accounts for about 65% of the annual rainfall. The other remaining rainfall typically occurs in the winter as less intense frontal systems in the Pacific. 
But in terms of runoff generation, uh, you have this sort of thing, and the hydrographs that we see below here are recorded at flume 6, flume 2, and flume 1 going downstream. And of course, you see a significant decrease in both the peak and the volume as the uh, runoff wave front travels down these dry ephemeral channels. Now, a little bit about the experiments. Um, Monsoon 90, uh, I guess, is the first step at getting together a number of the physical disciplines, namely soil scientists, remote sensing folks, atmospheric folks, hydrology folks, uh, to integrate remotely sensed data to look at the water and energy balance. Uh, Monsoon 90, although we have a, a long day here, was really temporally intensive in about a 10-day period when there were a lot of aircraft around uh, and that sort of thing. Now, there's a this is summarized in a special section of 1994 WRR. Now, in contrast to Monsoon 90, uh, Walnut Gulch 92 was temporally extensive uh, and that we were looking to characterize and get data not at the same intensity level but over the entire growing season with very similar objectives. But we also are starting to expand outside of Walnut Gulch uh, into the larger San Pedro Basin. And in that expansion, uh, there's some interesting scaling behavior and change in hydrologic processes that occurs. This is the San Pedro at the Reddington gauge, about 7,000 square kilometers. And here's the Walnut Gulch uh, side watershed, if you will, blown up on the side here that we saw before in color. Uh, what's plotted here in the lower right uh, it's mean annual runoff versus watershed area. Uh, apologies for the English units, but the trends are all that's really important. Both Walnut Gulch and the ARS Reynolds Creek watershed in Idaho are influent or losing environments. But then when you plot the same thing along the three main stem gauges, we see here on the San Pedro itself, we see a jump or a discontinuity in this relationship. And that's really occurring because now there's groundwater contributions from the regional aquifer, whereas in Walnut Gulch, the entire groundwater system is roughly 40 to 50 meters below, so it was really chosen to isolate surface water processes. And now we get into uh, a mixed system with both surface and uh, groundwater systems. Now, when we expand into the San Pedro, we also expand into the number of social economic issues that really make this an interesting place to do research. Just from a physical side, um, there's some very significant topographic and vegetation gradients, as there are in most mountain western watersheds. But in this 20-kilometer span, roughly from the riparian corridor to the top of the mountains, you transverse about 1,800 meters. And that's the bottom of their north-south transect in terms of the vegetation and climate changes. So although it makes it very diverse and variable, you've got all of this variability and heterogeneity in heterogeneity in the compact area. So logistically, it's easier to address that. Now, some of the, the more economic factors in uh, Sierra Vista, Fort Huachuca, uh, is the largest employer in southern Arizona, uh, and its current mission is very relevant for today's world in terms of um, uh, Army Communications Command, Electronic Proving Ground, UAV, you know, la foreign languages, and all of these things. So it's really seen as a critical installation for uh, our current military situation. Now, in Mexico, at the head of the wa watershed are the Cananea copper mines. Uh, they produce 2 to 3 percent of the world's copper. And both, of course, Sierra Vista, Fort Huachuca, and the, the uh, mine are significant water users. Now, that's the same water that sustains the riparian system here. And this area is really in an ecotone between the Sonoran Desert to the west, the Chihuahuan Desert to the east, the Rocky Mountains to the north, and the Sierra Madre to the south. And consequently, it's one of the most ecologically diverse areas in the world and was given a congressional designation as the first national repairing conservation area in 1988. Uh, it's really a primary migratory corridor for, I don't know, some 500 species of birds that are important to both Mexico, Canada, and the United States. And that's where the first application of international environmental law in the U.S. came in via the NAFTA side accords. And again, groundwater is really the sole source of water 
for sustaining both all of these uses, the repairing system as well as those in terms of mining industry and the people in the basin. So why are people so concerned about this? Well, they've got the perfect analog next door about what will happen if they don't take care of the water resources. Uh, on the upper left, we see population trends uh, that are projected by the Census Bureau in the southwest. You know, there's a major translocation of people in the southwest because the rest of the country is due to grow. They projected 5 to 10 percent, but the southwest is something like 30 percent. Um, on the top right is the seven-day low flow of the San Pedro River from the 1940s. Uh, that trend doesn't look very good. And in the basin right next door is the Santa Cruz River uh, that Tucson grew up on. This is the basin in the 1940s, and with repeat photography, you look at this cactus and this rock, you see those same things in the 80s imagery. Well, as Tucson grew, it pumped down the regional groundwater aquifer, and therefore the cottonwood could no longer be sustained, and there was some massive erosion. So completely different environment exists now. So. The San Pedro is one of the last free-flowing riparian systems in the southwest, and many of the um, environmental community are really drawing the line on this one because of these sort of things that they've seen in many places. So this whole thing is really about finding the balance between meeting ecosystem needs on one hand and meeting human demands on the other, both for now and growth in the future. So to attack this issue, um, and some of these problems, the core group out of the Monsoon 90 and Walnut Gulch groups formed uh, the Semi-Arid Land Surface Atmosphere or SOLSA program, uh, brought in a variety of other folks, and started to bring in some of the land management folks. The other transition to SOLSA now brings us more into the ecological and biotic side, or interdisciplinary in nature, but really more on the abiotic side. And we came up with this sort of catch-all question, if you will, to guide the research uh, about what are the consequences of natural and human-induced change in the water balance um, uh, and ecological diversity in these basins over a range of time scales. We came into our organizational meetings really organized along classic disciplines, but when we identified problems uh, such as riparian systems, landscape change that we'll talk more about in a moment, these problems really were the catalyst to bring these disciplines together. People could identify and say, I can do this piece and provide this piece of data, but I need this piece. And anyway, it was a good motivating factor to, to see where people could fit, contribute, and address a larger problem. So we came up with these focus areas, which we'll talk about um, a little bit more in some detail and go over those. Now, just in terms of program operation, in terms of you know, models for potential collaboration, uh, Jim Shuttleworth describes SALSA as open market versus centrally controlled, much like the, the SARA Science and Technology Center is. Open market meaning we didn't have a big pile of cash to attract investigators. We had some resources and leadership to sort of establish a foundation and encourage coordination, and we welcome newcomers uh, by writing letters of support for their proposals, offering them data. Um, basically, we said, you know, this is a neat place to do research. Bring your own resources. We'll, we'll give you all of these other things, and all we ask is that you leave behind what you've learned in terms of the local knowledge base. And we started now to involve the public uh, because of some of the problems pertinent in the basin, uh, we got more involved and conscious in those, and particularly in some of the riparian stuff. Like most of these programs, we wanted to develop some limited long-term observations, uh, take care of some model development and refinement, but these were sort of the central problems that we looked at. Land cover change and cross border differences, and riparian processes. Now, uh, I'll talk just a little bit about landscape change and a little bit more about riparian processes as we move through here. Now, in terms of landscape change, uh, the image on your left is a false color 1982 image of the basin with its outline. And I don't know if you'll be able to see it or not, but if you look carefully, you see the U.S.-Mexico border quite clearly on this image. Now, you, of course, really shouldn't see that from space, but due to 90 years of 
differences in land use activities on either side of the border, uh, there's really different land cover characteristics. So, of course, some obvious questions were, does this feed back into the hydrology of the system? Uh, does this feed back into potentially development of the atmospheric boundary layer? Now, one thing um, that we've got is multi-decadal uh, land classification of land covers from the 70s, 80s to the 90s. Uh, the white stuff up here is cloud cover. Here's the urbanization in the Sierra Vista region. And this is hard to see until you break it out by an individual class. So if you look at the mesquite uh, woodland land cover change, uh, red denotes a loss of that land cover in the respective time intervals, yellow no change, and green a gain. Um, so you see a huge or some 400% increase in mesquite during this time interval, which levels out after that. Well, the big loser was grassland, desert grassland, and again, significant urbanization. Uh, there are several reasons that still aren't fully clear as to why there was this explosion of woody land cover during this period, but uh, some people point to um, the concentration of El Nino events. Um, the, the woody species plants apparently are favored by increase in CO2. But of course, why isn't it increasing in these other time periods as well? So uh, still some more going on in that area. Now, from the repairing and water use standpoint, this is a, a question we got from the public, uh, quite a simple question, but it really, again, uh, focused our efforts in our discipline to say, how much water does the repairing vegetation use, and where does it come from? And now, you'd think as hydrologists we would have had all this sorted out by now, but typically ET um, has been treated as a residual, either coming out of a regional groundwater model or uh, other methods, and it has not been measured directly. So that was one of our goals here. And another thing to point out in the next slide is that the magnitude of the groundwater, surface water, and ET are all about the same, so we have to measure each of those with equal levels of uh, accuracy or certainty. Uh, the coupling demonstrated here, this is the discharge of the Charleston gauge, and this is just the temp daily temperature. You can see the diurnal influence and the same diurnal pattern in the discharge. Well, that's because during the day the trees are transpiring significant water and lowering the discharge. When you get to the first significant freeze shown by the red bar over here, you can immediately see a breakup of the diurnal pattern and a positive response in discharge because the trees have shut down, basically. So uh, again, this points to the fact that we really do have to look at these things uh, in sort of uh, with, with the same lens and the same degree of accuracy. With all of these folks and these different disciplines that we brought together on this side, uh, we, we created sort of our super site, if you will, at the Lewis Springs site with a control volume to make all of the measurements indicated in the diagram. I won't talk about all of these, but I'll talk about some of them. And we also, uh, again, we're taking remotely sensed data to, to try to extrapolate what we learned from this area. We had less intense measurements in an ephemeral and an intermittent reach as well, and extrapolate these over uh, the larger repairing corridor. So, this is where we tried to do coordinated measurements. Groundwater, surface water, energy balance, ET, uh, Vado zone storage, bank storage, remote sensing, uh, water sources. Uh, through the 97 growing season, we had five multi-day, 24-hour day campaigns uh, and subsets of the above measurements in these other two locations. I have included this picture here is, uh, this is a little training session. We didn't have enough money to instrument all of the shallow piezometers uh, and to do some of the stream sampling that we wanted to. So we put the call out in the local newspapers uh, for volunteers. These are relatively easy measurements to make, um, and we needed to do them over 24-hour periods. Well, this is a little training session. This is Don Poole of the USGS talking to people about how do we do these measurements, but more importantly explaining why we're doing them and why we're doing you know, all of these issues in this program. We had everyone show up from people from the Audubon and Nature Conservancy to the county attorney to 
uh, city council people, and I think part of this was just them coming to check us out. You know, were we honest brokers? Did we have an agenda or not? And although some of our data quality may have suffered by going this route, I do believe we gained a great deal of trust by doing so. So I guess the, the take home message here is if you can involve the public in some way, um, again, either information exchange, but more importantly, I think if you can get them in the field and involve them in some of your simpler measurements, that would be very beneficial. Uh, a little bit about water sources and why that's important. Um, this is a plot of uh, plant water sources in the three hydrologic regimes, perennial reach, intermittent reach, and ephemeral reach. And this is the percent of shallow moisture use after a monsoon event for three different species. Now, the reason this is important is if the plants are using just surface water, rainfall, runoff water sources, the whole system is really controlled by climatic. Significant amounts of groundwater, they become part of the entire larger groundwater system where pumping and management becomes into play. Now what this shows is that um, willow, for example, uh, has no indication that it will use surface waters, rainfall, when it becomes available. Uh, the inverse of this is you could say that, well, if the groundwater changes uh, and drops further, willow's probably going to get hit hardest because that's all it uses. Cottonwood, we're able to use about 10 to 20 percent of their water for from the surface water sources. But very interestingly, mesquite, we're able to use over 50 percent of their water from surface water when it became available. Um, so, of course, when we got into this, this was uh, not realized this, but this whole switching back and forth of surface and groundwater use complicates the whole sort of water budget for the repairing system to a great extent. So, just, just to describe some of the measurements that we made and how we went about them, uh, from an ET standpoint, this is an aerial view of the Cottonwood Willow Gallery. Uh, north of Highway 92, and you can see it's a relatively narrow corridor. Um, that typical eddy covariance or bone ratio techniques cannot be used because you don't have such conditions that are proper to uh, determine ET in this sort of situation. So we were scaling sap flux measurements, uh, first by looking at the breast height diameter and then doing stand surveys. This scaled sap flux was used to develop and calibrate a daily tendon on teeth model. Uh, the Los Alamos LIDAR scanning LIDAR system was in in August. For the sacatone, which is this green area, and the mixed mesquite grassland, we were able to get better fetch conditions and use both EC and bone ratio. Some other interesting measurements that were uh, validated here were scintillometer measurements for sensible heat flux. Uh, which allows you to, to compute an average sensible heat flux over a long path. So that was set up here in the homogeneous area with EC units underneath of it, um, shown to work, and then spread out over a mixed cover type, again with EC measurements in each of the representative areas. And again, that's summarized in some of the CELSA publications, but really worked out very well. And again, we want to scale these um, with remotely sensed measurements. Just a little bit of background about sap flux for those who may not be familiar with it. Uh, fairly common use in the uh, ecological field. Uh, the basic principle is you insert needles into the tree trunk. We see here uh, one needle, and this, this is a two needle design. There are three needle designs as well. You have basically a heater that puts out pulses of heat. The sap flow carries those pulses of heat up to a thermal couple and you can get sap flow velocity. So you relate the velocity to active sapwood area. In terms of scaling this, you then relate the breast height diameter versus the sapwood area. And then you can start aggregating from a tree to a cluster of trees to a reach, and then to compute a transpiration per unit canopy area. Uh, these are just a few measurements from the Raman scanning LIDAR uh, from Los Alamos. Uh, this is the, the primary mirror that's used to scan 
this is how it was set up on the east side of the river. You can see the scan lines over the riparian corridor. Here are a number of the sap flux clusters right here. And here's um, just one vertical slice. Uh, the, the red hippopotamus thing that you see here is the cottonwood willow canopy. Uh, these red blobs are ejections of water vapor out of this thing, a uh, quite interesting field. Um, in terms of how these things uh, both eject and have fluxes of latent heat flux. And over a longer term average, uh, we have a comparison of what the LIDAR latent heat energy fluxes are in comparison to the sap flow uh, on these clusters. And again, we were quite happy with those results. Now, in terms of scaling this up further, we wanted to go to a longer term and larger scale water balance. This is that same supersite area, if you will, in Lewis Springs. But this odd shaped thing here is the riparian corridor over a 10 kilometer reach from Lewis Springs to the downstream USGS gauge at Charleston. Uh, the, the thing you see at the top here are the cover characteristics. Uh, different vegetation type, types, pre and post entrenchment in the second, and then we're independently estimating all the components of the water balance over this reach for a 90-day pre-monsoon period. Now, the reason we couldn't go into the monsoon is because of this mesquite water issue that went on that we discovered er earlier isotopically and that we didn't know how or to what degree the plants would be using surface water when it became available. But in the pre monsoon we knew they were using groundwater. And in doing all of this, the closure errors were roughly 5.2%. So again, we were very encouraged by that. Of course, you can have compensating errors in these things, but uh, we felt uh, this was a logical way to go about making these measurements and scaling them, uh, making direct measurements. Some of the salsa products, uh, just uh, all of these research results that I've talked about are summarized in a SALSA special issue, the November 2000 issue of Ag and Forest Meteorology. Um, one thing I do want to point out here is that um, you, know, you don't have to give up peer-reviewed science to do these things and to also address some more of the watershed issues. Of course, we had special sessions at professional meetings, a very useful product that we all needed as researchers was all of the GIS data for the basin. And we took a little time, and particularly through our colleagues at EPA, we were able to package this data in a nice user interface with a browser format to get, you know, you name it, all of the GIS data, all of the land cover data, and this is available online um, as well at an EPA website. Um, again, very, very useful tool. Um, Miracle of the Desert River was produced by BLM in cooperation with all the investigators, which is a multimedia bilingual CD, both English and Spanish, that really sort of told the story of the basin and how science was uh, being used to address it. The cover that we see here are the proceedings to a different kind of meeting. This is a binational meeting held not for scientists to scientists, but really for scientists to the public, and inversely, we asked a lot of the public and decision makers, what do they need to make decisions? What's important to them in terms of trying to figure out how our science can best interface to meet these needs? So uh, again, this is a different type of meeting with a very different slant than something like an AGU meeting, uh, but I think it's critical, again, to not only prove your, um, you know, your, your ability to deliver good, uh, neutral science, uh, but to also engage the community. Now, what's going on po post salsa? This all sort of wrapped up those products in 1999-2000, in being used in Morocco now uh, by some of our French co-investigators that were heavily involved in salsa. Rane Sherboni is leading this effort uh, in Morocco right now, and this is underway and uh, proceeding quite well. Um, health or the UNESCO program for hydrology for the environment, life, and policy, as well as SARA, NSF Science and Technology Center, two of their key goals are effective integration of state of the science knowledge into policy and decision making. And both of these have said, you know, there, there's really uh, a gap, if you will, in getting our science into the whole decision making arena. Um, 
the HELP program uh, has named the Upper San Pedro and the partnership as one of the, I think, first three in the world as far as effective operational uh, health watersheds where they see an effective integration of science and decision making. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the San Pedro partnership. Um, interesting mechanism. I don't know if this could be duplicated in other basins. Uh, this sort of grew from very much the ground up but it's a wide range of agencies and firms, NGOs, everyone from Nature Conservancy to Audubon to Fort Huachuca to uh, the elected officials in the cities. USGS and ourselves at ARS are really the, the scientific or technical members of this. You know, we don't make decisions, of course, but we try to provide the information and the science so they can make better decisions. Now, this is quite formally organized. This Partnership Advisory Commission is primarily elected officials and, and land managers who are making decisions on the ground. Uh, staff working group uh, really works through the majority of things, recommends things to this group. Administrative subcommittee handles money, project management, that sort of thing. Very conscious of bringing the public along. So there's a lot of efforts in an outreach committee that's doing um, a variety of things, anything from surveys to say how does the public want to get information, uh, taking and distilling scientific re results, summarizing them, putting them in uh, either newspaper inserts, websites, mailings, and all that sort of thing. And a technical committee that really does the research formulation, develops scopes of work that are then reviewed by all of these other committees before research is initiated, and in some cases they do hire consultants as well. So I, I just like to say, what does partnership mean in this context? Um, you know, some of the obvious things, of course, working together to gather uh, and share data and information, but it's really also lending political support and institutional support for each other's projects and identifying and leveraging together. And I really think, and again, this is maybe my own biased view, that um, this is because I've been involved in both. This effort is a step beyond the sort of traditional science stakeholder technology transfer where we as scientists may develop models and data uh, and then say, oh, look at this neat tool. We can adapt it to use it in your situation. To a case where we're sitting down with the decision makers to plan our research so we know the research will directly meet their needs in terms of decision making. Um, now, what are some of the new things we're doing now, both under the Upper San Pedro Partnership umbrella and the SARA umbrella? Uh, and again, there are a lot of other projects that are being leveraged here as well. Um, we identified, made a lot of progress in SALSA and the riparian ecosystem, but also identified some key shortcomings. And so basically, mesquite was one of those. Uh, we started some detailed mesquite investigations to look at both understory, overstory, soil evaporation, do um, transpiration partitioning. The, the yellow, or the I'm sorry, all of the coil tubing you see here is to collect water vapor samples as a function of height so that you can isotopically uh, differentiate where the water vapor came from, whether it was soil, understory uh, non-woody species or larger woody species. Uh, isotope work, again, to identify the percentage of groundwater use. Uh, we brought in carbon fluxes, look at nutrient fluxes in soils, and put in a lot more spatially distributed uh, cross sections along the riparian corridor uh, to measure groundwater surface water information as well as vegetation as well as more MET sites to get an idea of the spatial variability of the driving climatic forces. So here's some interesting findings that have come out of this. Um, this is going on, and this isn't isolated just in this repairing area, but think about all the woody species invasion that's going in throughout the West. In the repairing situation, we have this uh, perhaps shrub and or um, grassland environment, and as these woody species and mesquite get larger, they effectively tap a stable source of groundwater. Now, mesquite, of course, are nitrogen fixers, uh, and they produce nitrogen-rich litter that's falling on the ground here all the time. However, the microbes in the surface soil here 
don't have water except for the very limited periods when there's precipitation going on. So they really don't break down this material very actively. And what you do is get a very large buildup of high quality litter. And as it turns out, if you look at the carbon levels in these soils, it's more than unplowed native prairie in Nebraska in these areas. And that's because you've got a nitrogen source. You can't sequester carbon unless you've got a stable source of nitrogen as well. So again, this is the sort of thing that maybe was a, a bit um, something we didn't anticipate. The decision makers in the basin really are thinking water right now. And But what is the value of the repairing system? Many of them think, well, it's just using all of this water. Well, if carbon credits and carbon markets ever get developed, this area in the repairing system is a huge source for carbon sequestration. So it may have some market economic value in the, the downstream years. So this is the sort of thing as the back and forth between the decision makers and the scientists that we can educate each other on and, you know, uh, help guide their decision making. Now, and I call this the amazing mesquite. This is really uh, something entirely different than I was taught in terms of hydrology and how plants were treated very much like straws in, uh, in water in terms of capillary and pressure forces. What we did is we put in, and not we meaning the group, um, put in sap flux sensors in the main stem of a mesquite tree, in the lateral roots, which are shallow, and in the deep tap root of the mesquite. Now what's plotted here is the depth to groundwater fluctuations very nearby this tree. And in blue, we have the trace from the tap root sap flow, the velocity, and in green, the lateral. Positive on this graph means the water is flowing toward the main stem of the tree, or upward, if you will. Now, before the monsoon, you see what you, you might typically see in terms of the tap root in blue is bringing up water, and that water is going away from the tree trunk, this negative area, to maintain the lateral root systems in the shallow area. Now, when the monsoon comes along, and you start getting precipitation indicated by these white stars, you see a reversal. The lateral roots are now taking water into the trunk, and the tap roots are putting the water down, uh, in essence, banking the water. Um, and what's very, and we can see that here and over in this region after this large precipitation event. Again, we have negative flow down the root system. And it appears, this is a little, uh, you know, harder to prove, but from just a strictly observational sense that if you look at the magnitude of the groundwater fluctuations, that there may be enough recharge going on in this that you're actually affecting the fluctuations in the groundwater table. Again, a large, dense stand of mesquite. So we have bidirectional sap flow. We're redistributing water upward when dry and outward, downward with abundant rainfall, uh, and What's even more interesting is during the winter, uh, there's evidence of downward flow in these roots. So in other words, in our two precipitation environment, these plants appear to be putting water down during the winter when the other grasses and surface plants are senescent, and they're senescent as well, getting it below their root system and then using it later before the pre-monsoon. So this may be a very competitive or, or competitive advantage that is allowing, again, these woody species to overtake grasslands throughout the West. So other things that we're doing right now um, have to do with how do we better quantify different components of the hydrologic budget in the basin. Uh, a common assumption in this area was that recharge typically occurs along the mountain fronts in this basin and range topography. Uh, well, with some of the detailed instrumentation we have in Walnut Gulch, in this reach between Flume 2, 7, and 1, here are some of the channel segments here, uh, we used a variety of techniques to say what is the quantity of water that is getting down to the groundwater uh, aquifer by losses through ephemeral storms uh, and storm runoff. The blue bars that you see here are depth 
in Flume 1 during runoff events, this is 1999 monsoon season, and this is the 2000 monsoon season. And the, the colored traces are from these wells in a cross section just above Flume 1. So there's a significant amounts of water going down. And in all of these methods that we use from chloride to isotopes to microgravity, we got agreement among all of these methods uh, under a factor of three. And if you scale this up using some quite crude scaling in the basin, the point is that ephemeral channel recharge in wet years could potentially be up to 40% of the total basin recharge in comparing to uh, a long-term groundwater model. Now, that's sort of comparing apples to oranges, so uh, it may not be the best comparison, but at least we know this is a player in the water budget, and it's going to have to be considered in the future. Um, now, other things we're doing. In terms of uh, refining our riparian water use estimates, what happens in cottonwoods as they age from this sort of system and die out and become larger established cottonwoods, their LAI changes. Uh, they get more crowned out. They have fewer branches in the lower regions of the tree. Uh, and here's some of the data that we found during SALSA is that there is a distinct difference in LAI between old and young trees, and that directly translates into a difference in water use per unit area. Now, this is the sort of situation. The active channel is laying down younger trees, and these remnant channels are where you have the older trees uh, where you have some mortality and you're getting fewer of the larger trees. Now, spectrally, we can't tell these things apart, so we can't differentiate the water use. So we're using airborne LIDAR imagery to actually measure the geometry of the trees uh, and some of their characteristics to try to classify them different by their age groups to refine our water use estimates. Another thing that SARA is bringing to the table in terms of the uh, econ economics folks that are coming involved is uh, we're trying through to look at stakeholder developed scenarios to try to say uh, really evaluate what's the worth of this repairing system. Now they've done market evaluations where you say you know X number of birders come into the basin, generate this much in terms of hotels, uh, restaurants, and that sort of thing, but non-market evaluation in terms of the aesthetics of the system, um, the existence value, people that value this system in New York, even though they may never be there, um, is much harder to measure. Well, David Brookshire at University of New Mexico has survey techniques to try to quantify these things, but we have enough information to link both the physical hydrologic sciences to the riparian habitat the biology ecology, to the birds, so we've got ornithology folks involved, and to say what is the value of this system, both in market and non-market terms. So uh, we feel this is a nice end-to-end -end linkage uh, to put these together. And what we're trying to do in the second phase of SARA is to really concentrate many of our graduate students between the boxes, again, to train people that do look at things in a more interdisciplinary nature versus going deeper in in an individual box. So interesting uh, thing happened here recently. Uh, some people in the House, some Congress folks, introduced some legislation that was basically trying to let Fort Huachuca off the hook from its um, impact on endangered species via water. Well, John McCain, Senator McCain, got involved in some compromise legislation that named the Upper San Pedro Partnership as the entity that's going to manage water to protect the river and provide sustainable yield. And as part of this process, report to Congress, or the partnership has to report to Congress on an annual basis and come up with this plan to bring the basin into sustainability by 2011. Here are some of the requirements for the report. Um, you know, who's responsible, how's it going to be done. But more importantly, from a hydrologic standpoint, there's some quantities that we as scientists, I think, can contribute to this in terms of annual recharge. Uh, how do they verify that an activity such as um, trying to recharge um, urban runoff really does uh, get water back into the aquifer? So 
we've developed a plan uh, between the USGS, ourselves, and BLM. These are, don't worry about what's on these, but the dots represent a variety of information in terms of both surface water and groundwater monitoring. Uh, part of this plan is to also measure all these other things, basin cover, repairing vegetation, repairing ET, recharge. Um, but basically, uh, if this gets instituted and the folks have just gone back to Washington to talk about resources to make this happen, uh, if all of this is instituted, you'll basically have the rudiments for a long-term hydrologic observatory, much like Quasi is envisioning, over about a 2,500 to 3,000 square kilometer region. Now, of course, Mexico is down here, and 1,800 kilometers uh, lies in Mexico. Some work is going on there, but not nearly the density that is going on here. So food for thought on that front. Now, what are some of the strategies and lessons learned from this whole process and evolution? Um, in my opinion, an ARS is a national organization that does you know, work all over the country, but the best way to encourage interdisciplinary science and collaboration is by picking a place, because people are looking at the same piece of ground, uh, often doing field work together to establish a rapport, uh, and it just seems to be a good way to do it. And the needs and problems of the place are really drivers, again, for integration. Um, but again, I make the point you can't dictate collaboration. Uh, a lot of this is working uh, and developing this relationship and getting along with one another and trusting one another, not only from a scientific perspective, but also from the, the decision maker perspective. Now, in our case, at least in Salsa, uh, if you build it, or at least a foundation, they will come if there's good science and compelling social issues. Uh, we had a lot of success with that, again, with people bringing their own resources because it was an exciting place to do work. Another thing we, we observed is that there's really potentially an optimal size for a place in terms of place-based research. Walnut Gulch itself wasn't large enough to have a sufficient number of social and nucleus of people together to form something like the Upper San Pedro Partnership. Now, if it's too big, uh, and as far as other focus basin is the Rio Grande, there just may be too many issues, and it may be too difficult to get all the players in the room at the same time. Uh, Fred Phillips also made a very astute observation in that, you know, he said, um, in the Rio Grande, a irrigator or someone working in um, northern or southern Colorado may have very little sense of what's going on in terms of irrigation in southern New Mexico. In the San Pedro, the basin's small enough so that people can drive across it, they can see its, its condition, and they have a physical connectedness to it. If it's too big, it may be hard to do to get all of the voices heard and get some agreement or a group like the partnership that can move forward in a unified fashion. Now, what's the motivation for policymakers to do joint work with scientists? Uh, a key issue is community-based or local decision making. Now, Bruce Babbitt, then Secretary of the Interior, came to our SALSA wrap-up meeting and sort of told the locals, you get your house in order or the federal courts will do it for you. And this was a big motivating factor to get the partnership to work. Again, a lot of these people have diverse opinions, but they can, they've got enough trust with each other that they can sit in the room and disagree, but yet move on toward a common goal. Another issue is to avoid lawsuits. Um, uh, and some people believe even issues here will come to legal action, but all the parties involved in this have been open to the design of the data collection and the research so that even if it does go to court, we hope people will agree upon the data and they can argue about the interpretations of the data. The other issue is, of course, uh, managers have a tougher problem now. Uh, there's more complex management decisions that need to be made that really do have to bring in more discipline. That's typically not available in the, the typical consulting community. Uh, that's changing, I know. They do hire consultants to do a number of things, but we've been able, and I think Quasi can serve this sort of role too, is to bring a wide array of disciplines together to attack these things. Again, I'd like to reiterate that you don't have to give up 
you know, your published research results and peer-reviewed journals to work with decision makers. Uh, you can do both if you're smart about it. Now, again, more lessons learned. Long-term presence and commitment counts. Again, back to this issue of building relationships and trust. Needs a lot of meetings. Needs a lot of communication. Not only do you have to get over what I'm sure many of you experienced in terms of interdisciplinary work of learning another discipline's vocabulary, you've got to do the same thing with decision makers uh, in terms of what's important to them. They can understand what you're saying and vice versa. Now, this other point about making a significant commitment by senior scientists. Uh, remember, these people that we're sitting down with, and I'm typically down there two days a month, are county managers, city managers, mayors, uh, heads of the fourth. They have hundreds of millions of dollar budgets, and they want folks on the scientific side that can make commitments as well. Of course, not to that scale, but that can commit resources to get things done. The point here is that, uh, and this is starting to be recognized, I know, by NSF and NOAA, is that the typical three-year grant cycle is really an in insufficient time frame to build this trust. Um, you know, there's been a lot of studies done in the San Pedro, but these decision makers don't sit down and really engage a lot of these people because they know they'll be gone shortly. They're not there for the long term. Uh, another thing that's going on right now uh, that I think needs to be done in all these cases, uh, we can even do it scientifically, is we have to define quantifiable measures of success. Uh, the partnership has this nice sort of apple pie goal of enough water for the river and the people of the basin, but they're in the process, they've done some of this, of what are quantifiable metrics in terms of hydrologic groundwater levels, gradients, uh, vegetation, habitat characteristics to say, yeah, the river is healthy. And on the same side, what does it mean to be have enough water for the people? Is that you know X number of golf courses per numbers of people? You know all of those sorts of issues. But those have to be wrestled with. Otherwise, you're going to have, uh, of course, subjective disagreements. And finally, um, you know we can and must work together. I think to address major scientific challenges. And I think quasi is really a big step for the hydrologic community in doing this. Much like the, the um, astronomy and oceanographic community, we have to think big science and getting ourselves together to address big problems because they're certainly here in the water environment in many places throughout the world. You know, we can do, of course, interdisciplinary research, but it's really hard work. You know, in many cases, I know I could publish a lot more papers if I just did my very narrow uh, focused science thing, uh, but I don't know that I'd have the same amount of impact that I would in this broader spectrum. And it's fun for me, too, in terms of learning. I couldn't go to these journals and other disciplines and learn nearly as much as I have as working with these people. And again, this is my bias again in the third opinion, that I really do think there's greater scientific gain to be made per unit effort between disciplines than within more focused efforts within a single discipline. And again, uh, particularly if we're looking at quasi-HOs and the size of 10,000 square kilometers, we have to engage and work in partnerships with policy and decision makers. You know, we can't control or will never be able to control that much land to do just what we want to do from a scientific perspective. And the only way we're going to not only achieve our scientific goals that have a broader impact is to work in these sorts of partnerships. So with that, um, I'm done. Thank you for your time and attention, and please feel free to open it up for questions. Dave, thanks a lot. That was a great talk. Very interesting. Thank you. So to ask a question, it's star one or type a chat. It's time to wake up, everybody. OK, gentlemen, you have your first question from David Tuck from Napologic. David, please go ahead. Wonderful talk, David. I really enjoyed it. Thank um, you. My pleasure. Um, I was curious about the, the mesquite. Um, very interesting information you showed where the uh, mesquite coverage grew significantly from the period 96 to or 70, 73 to 86. 73 to 86, okay. 
And then the information he pr proposed later, he showed how he was very um, uh, flexible in its water usage, I guess is probably the best point. Mm -hmm. uh, has there any study been done to look at the uh, population growth in that uh, time frame, 73 to 86, and the water table decline that may have occurred? And perhaps that gave the mesquite flexible capabilities, gave it an advantage during that time frame? Um, yeah, there has population growth in the area. Uh, there are water table declines that are going on. Um, I don't know that in the upland regions, though, the, uh, we're doing comparable work with the mesquite now in upland regions to see if they behave in a similar way. They, of course, can't get their roots down to sort of a stable groundwater supply like they can near the river. But what we're finding is that they're still redistributing water like this, and we think that, uh, again, they're banking some water. Um, and what occurred during that 73 to 86 period was a large number of El Nino events, which give uh, more, provide more winter rainfall in this region. Uh, and some of the ecology folks have said winter rainfall and slightly warmer temperatures favors the establishment of woody species. So in, in the usual sequence of, we ha of winter rainfall and the fact that these plants can utilize that winter rainfall more effectively than the other plants. Um, to follow up with that, um, there was that slide we showed where the, the comparing the willow and the mesquite and the cottonwood in terms of their usage of the shallow soil water. Yes. Um, again, is that uh, the uh, mesquite was much more flexible and able to use the shallow surface water. Did that, again, give it a competitive advantage over, say, the cottonwood and willow? Uh, yes. Um, you know, in our opinion, the, you know, in other words, uh, if the groundwater level drops, um, let me see if I can find that slide and, and bring it up quickly. If the groundwater level drops, uh, it's number... Okay. Okay. If the groundwater level drops, the willow can't exploit any surface water, or they don't show any tendency to, even if it is there. So they're really dependent upon that. Whereas the mesquite, in particular, and the cottonwood, somewhat can use that water. So, you know, let's say there's a, a climatic change. And you, you do have more or longer or more frequent monsoon. Uh, the mesquite will obviously be able to survive, where and the groundwater table drops at the same time. The willows will not. Okay. Let's see. I see a question from John Wilson. What other vegetation has water banking capability? Um, don't know yet. I would guess that pinyon juniper does. Uh, I don't know enough about the physiology of that plant, but I guess I'd recommend sort of experimentation that occurred here. We're doing some work also on, um, you know, acacia, creosote, and some of these other things, but we really, because their roots are so small, we can't really isolate, you know, tap roots from lateral roots uh, to try to sort this question out, but I would I guess be surprised maybe if PJ did not do that. Bill, are there any other questions in the queue? Bill? I'm sorry, yes we do. We have one from Carmel Burns from Utah State University. Please proceed. Now this is actually P. Busby. Can you hear me? Yes. Question is the deal is the question of uh, what role did uh, are you seeing from the university partners? Uh, are they able to engage and provide the uh, commitment to the to the local working group in the in any way similar to what you've been able to do with, as an ARS scientist and and using the Walnut Dutch experimental is. Uh, as one of your properties that require you to participate like this? Um, we've had extensive university participation in this, but um, a university professor 
you know, their primary job is education, doesn't really have the time to go down to meet on um, the same sort of frequency that, say, I would. Now, Kevin Lanzi at the University of Arizona is developing the decision support system where a lot of this science will be housed. He meets with the partnership a lot, um, but he hasn't been able to do it over as long a time span as I have. You know, he's getting to be trusted more in this whole position. But I guess um, it would be, given the way our current reward systems are set up, uh, I think it might be difficult unless um, the, the university system, reward system, says you will engage these people. And that's part of your job, and you'll be rewarded for it. So, again, we've had a lot of good research from the university folks, but not sort of, you know, seven years or eight years of ongoing meetings with these folks. Thank you. Yep. Other questions, comments? Mike Burkhart must have a question. <laughs> I saw him on the list. <laughs> At this time, gentlemen, we have no further questions in the audio queue. Well, thank you very much for uh, hearing me out, and I uh, hope it was worthwhile use of your time. Actually, gentlemen, we do have a follow-up question from uh, David Tuck in Napologic. Go ahead, David. Thank you, John. Um, one of the things I noted you made, you made the, the point about was to plan research to meet decision maker needs. Um, do you have any comments about how to go about doing that? Well, uh, you know, part of this is, again, a fairly long-term process in terms of uh, convincing you know, that we as scientists, of course, want to study everything. Uh, they're really providing a filter for us to say what's really important in terms of the decisions that we have to make in terms of managing this basin. So the way this sort of occurred in the establishment of these committees and whatnot is us as scientists bringing issues forward to them uh, and sometimes, of course, we had a nice long laundry list, and in many cases they said, no, 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 what do you really need to do to answer this question? And it's a back and forth in terms of a sifting and winnowing to say, this is the research that you know, has not been done in the literature that will allow you to address your question. So it's, it's really a lot of time together. Does that help? Yeah, I think that's pretty straightforward. Yeah, yeah, it, it is. It's it's really an investment of time in building the trust. Right, and time with the decision makers. Yep, yep, and that you know that is typically not an audience we, or at least in in the pure academic community, um, deal with a great deal. Uh, I've got a little. I'm sort of in between. Again, I think our reward systems make it hard for university folks to do that. And again, I'm just saying on my experience and uh, from University of Arizona standpoint, we're in an adjunct I thought, faculty. I thought that was an excellent comment, Dave, uh, in terms of the reward systems. There's other issues, too, that I've seen. Um, back when I used to work with, are you, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, back when I used to work with uh, Westinghouse, Van River Company down in South, uh, South Carolina, I put a proposal in that was, oh, I can't remember, was it was into NSF, and they encouraged quote unquote interdisciplinary proposals, but my proposal got trashed from people that were in uh, different di disciplines um, in terms of their specific area. And as a, as a result, the overall proposal got sunk. Um, do you have any comments how to uh, address that issue? Now, we went through the same experience with a big salsa proposal, and, you know, it, we had tried to cover so many disciplines and so much work that any one person in their focused discipline could pick it apart. Right. And so, yeah, the, 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 the panels, in terms of evaluation of these proposals, um, you know, I think need, and this is changing, but there's a lag in the system, have to have a, a different mindset um, in terms of trying to look at the value of the sum of the parts versus 
you know, they didn't do it quite right in this particular area. So it is a challenge, and they're, they're frankly a, a lot harder to pitch. I, I remember when, um, was it Corel uh, was head of geoscience uh, at NSF, and I said, how do you pitch a proposal like Tulsa to NSF? And he said, that's the Achilles heel of NSF. Now, this was a number of years ago, and I, as I say, I think they're changing, but the program managers, you know, have a pot of money. They're under pressure to fund things in that discipline, and unless there's some informal agreements to share money across things, things you, you often keep it in that discipline. As I say, the Science and Technology Center is a good way to get around all of that, but, but I think it's a, um, it's a shortcoming of the current system. Now, I don't want to talk for NSF, but these are just some of my observations. Okay, I see a question from Dartmouth. Uh, do you see any isotopic differences in height with your water vapor measurements? Uh, and the answer is yes. Um, we can basically distinguish um, the relative percentages of evaporation from the bare soil surface and then differentiate between the, the components of the C3 and C4 species. That work is about to be published, uh, but if you'd like to send me an email, I can get you directed to the right people on that. Um, does, does that, you know, please follow up with another item if that does not answer your question. From Mike Burkhart, uh, thank you, Mike. Can, can you provide an example of how your information received from policymakers changed your science? Um, Yes, uh, one example uh, is uh, they got this notion um, that because of urbanization in the basin, they're generating runoff water that would otherwise be evaporated on grasslands or uplands. So they've also got the notion that they can file for surface water rights for this extra water. Now, that hasn't been tested in court yet. Uh, so we've done, you know, to, to try to address this, some modeling work, and now we're trying to do some data collection to say, all right, what, look, look at pre-development, post-development conditions that either have occurred or adjacent basins, and look at sort of runoff yield from a variety of, of storm climate conditions, and do you, in fact, get more runoff water out of these things? And if so, is it economical to build retention and detention ponds to try to recharge it into the ground. Uh, back from Dartmouth, uh, thank you for that email. I'll get you um, connected with the right people. It's uh, David Williams at the University of uh, Wyoming, and I'll make sure I get um, your email to him with an introductory note. Gentlemen, your next question comes from Larry Parsons from the University of Florida. Go ahead, Larry. Yes, sap flow measurements and some of the precautions and issues you have to deal with in terms of getting good sap flow types of measurements. What kind of equipment did you use? Uh, we originally, um, well, we went through several companies and fr frankly we're building our own sensors now. Um, I'd recommend, there, there's a two-prong design and a three-prong design, and I'd recommend the three-prong because you also can get some estimates of diffusion of water, uh, both going down and up the trunk, so you can refine your measurements a little bit. Um, again, I will refer you to um, David Williams again, uh, and then another guy in our shop who uh, could answer that question a lot more intelligently than myself. Okay, also, thank you. Well, just one other comment. The um, uh, ring porous species like mesquite, uh, who have a much what, more complex ring pattern than cottonwood, uh, we found to be very, very much harder to measure with sap flow. We did, I think, a pretty good job in terms of the cottonwood and willow with these sap flow sensors, but were the, the jury's still out on the mesquite. Thank you. Yep. Gentlemen, we have no further questions in the audio queue.
Okay, well, Dave, thank you very much. Good. Well, thank you. And, uh, and again, please uh, feel free to send me some emails if I can help you follow up with any other contacts or information you'd like. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. Have a good day.